I begin with a beautiful quote just to get your attention. Uh, Europe is a thought that needs to become a feeling. Do you know who said that? Ta da! There you have it. Bono said. And it's something that we heard in the plenary discussion this morning. It's something that kind of uh, was hinted at uh, or explicitly addressed by the first presented by Katerina. It's something that I think uh, transpires to some extent in the uh, examples that Dan just brought up. So the question is, can we recruit the help of technology to communicate this feeling effectively? Uh, and uh, I will not be uh, prescriptive. I'll be descriptive uh, a little at least in this section, and uh, try to describe a little bit what I'm talking about, the technology-driven campaigning in my title. What does that mean? It's something that, um, again, people like me, researchers, have looked at for some time, and what it means is that it's a lot about big data analytics. What do uh, campaigners uh, do? They collect and compile online and offline data about voters, lots and lots of data about lots and lots of voters. They apply big data methods, computational methods to make sense of it, statistical processes, simply put. And then they design messages that target classes of individuals on the basis of the results of this analysis. And the point of doing all this work is that you would create personalized political messages that persuade and mobilize. This is the interesting part. You don't just you know, carpet bomb, you pinpoint the right person, the right group, with the right message. And then you can address diversity. And this is why this can be so important and so interesting for a European audience. Because again, like Katina also discussed, we are very diverse. It's very difficult to create one message that everyone everywhere would love, even more so than in a national context. So you would think that technology and this type of analysis would be very used and useful for a, a pan-European uh, pan-European campaign. In particular, again, thanks to Dan for like bringing social media into focus, if we think about the social media uh, pot potential to overcome borders. Uh, the, we're looking at the same platforms used around Europe and around the world. So we all look at Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, what have you. They're all the same, the same structure, the same algorithm that is easily integrated. The same digital tools are used by communicators. Uh, they are based on the same digital infrastructure, same digital architectures, and the people who uh, are the target uh, audiences have usually the same habits or can easily be grouped in uh, habit groups. English is the lingua franca for a lot of this uh, social media communication. And even if it's not so, you will have automated translation that overcomes language barriers and it reduces the, uh, the again, potential to, um, to isolate certain groups. Um, and again, people who have worked with this you know exactly what I'm talking about. I can also respond to more questions. There are also tools for scheduling messages according to different time zones. So again, diversity in terms of geolocation can also be addressed uh, through social media um, and the accompanying um, uh, toolkits that uh, social media provides. So I think there's a lot of useful, uh, useful technology there that can be used. So the question is, is technology used to maximize the transnational potential of social media? And I'm looking at the uh, European Parliament in particular um, because I'm interested in campaigns. I'm interested in which way the uh, upcoming European elections are going to be uh, perhaps moving Europeans in this transnational di uh, direction. Of course, the emotional dimension is important, as already mentioned, but also the political mobilization can be interesting. So I'm presenting to you a bit of uh, research that is still ongoing, uh, but just to give you a hint of what I'm talking about. Um, and this research is based on interviews with communicators for, uh, the, for six uh, EP party groups. And I'm looking at party groups knowing that they're not necessarily active in the campaigning, but they are nevertheless representing Europeans, right? And again, I'm looking at Twitter because, uh, as previously mentioned, it's probably the most used uh, social media platform um, by, uh, by the communicators themselves. So what I was trying to see is like, is social media used in a transnational strategic fashion by the EP party groups? Uh, and I try to, uh, um, to analyze their Twitter output and see uh, which languages do they, uh, do they use, which kind of users, which kind of user profiles do they have. 
which kind of topics. And then in my conversations with these, with these communicators, I wanted to know their approach to understanding what they're dealing with, their like meta level, not only their output, but how they choose to interpret it. So I'll just show you a couple of pictures just to give you an idea of the data. And this is data that the groups themselves gave me. Uh, so the, I looked at the ALDE, and you could see a classical, uh, classical distribution of gender, 66% uh, men, 34% women. Languages, as I was mentioning before, English is the lingua franca, and then unsurprisingly, um, Spanish, French, Italian, and German, but again, very, very low percentages. And again, it's difficult. It's difficult to uh, use uh, Twitter for uh, geolocation because a lot of users do not actively point themselves <coughs> to a specific place. But you can see here, apropos bubbles, that we have uh, in countries, Belgium, United Kingdom, Spain, France, and so on. Belgium being, though, the number one. Uh, okay, and let me show you what, what type of uh, um, content analysis um, can be run on the engagement with users, which is not very high. And I was looking at who, um, who they are engaging with and what are they talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, can you take that? This is going to happen again. Okay. Um, so you could see that the, the people that are engaged by the ALDI are often partner parties, right? So these are the, the dialogue is within the partner parties. There are very few, um, very few um, users, but there's some. Uh, there's Steve, for example, if you see there. So there's a person, there's a, there's a human, a citizen that has been involved, uh, but not, a, not much, much else. You could also look at the, um, at the word cloud. Again, this is extremely rudimentary uh, frequency analysis, but it just gives you an idea that the content is a lot of references to other, other politicians and other parties. Something is not happening. Did it work? Still not? <clears throat> yes, thank you. Uh, and um, this uh, is uh, an analysis of the content that uh, all the uh, communicators created. And you would look at the word cloud. Again, it's non-filtered uh, by, by any criteria. It's simple frequencies. And you would try to get um, an idea about the messages they're trying to put out. And they kind of make sense from a, their point of view. You can also see the references. You also see the, the kind of um, impetus towards mobilization, uh, political slogans to live better lives, stuff like that. So from their own point of view, what they say it seems to be quite uh, on target, but it's also almost exclusively in English. Uh, and whereas their uh, users also uh, communicated in other languages. So there's a little bit of a mismatch there. Uh, just to compare with the Greens, which is a smaller, smaller group, um, the demographics look identical pretty much. Um, and uh, the uh, analysis of their engagement, uh, so comments, replies, left to uh, tweets made by the Greens. You can see that, again, they're talking to each other, looking at the, uh, um, at the at uh, mentions. And again, if you look at the content, there's almost no, no actual content in the word cloud. There's only tags of other people, mentions of other people. If you look at what they say, you can uh, also look at the uh, word cloud and see that they, their message is very much on point, but it's also exclusively in English. And the interesting part is say, okay, I've done this very rough analysis, going back to technology. How many of the communicators that I talked to actually did this analysis themselves? Very few, let's put it this way. When I ask them, which, in order to get this data, I ask them like, um, could you please give me uh, the overview of your user base, your segmentation by audience, the languages, the things that I was trying to find out. I said, um, which tool should we use to get you that? That was the question. I said, okay, you can use maybe Hootsuite, something. Oh, but that's with a license. We cannot 
do that. We don't do that. So the data that they showed me, the demographics are the free data that you get from the Twitter analytics dashboard. Again, probably a very familiar site too, most of it. So a majority of the communicators for the EP groups do not use any additional tools to analyze their Twitter stream. And uh, a majority of them do not provide themselves and their respective uh, po politicians with any kind of data overview. So what I have done, they have not done. And I, again, this is like extremely rudimentary. I just wanted to show you something to give you a, a flavor of what this could be, right, for the, for the sake of the presentation. If I were to do this more consistently, it would look uh, definitely much more, uh, much more interesting, much, more, much richer data. So um, I'm, uh, I'm saying there's definitely limits in the way social media is being used in the party, by the party groups. And I asked also why, and again, I think some of the, some of the uh, points are uh, also something that Dan was hinting at in his answer to, uh, to a question from, from you. Um, first of all, there is a great amount of skepticism from the political side towards technology and social media. Uh, I don't know exactly how to explain this. I haven't talked to politicians. This is my next step. Uh, but it appears that politicians do not see the value of social media involvement, engagement, and do not see the reason why technology should be an investment. They do not prioritize that as a whole. Again, I don't point to any particular person, just as a, as a group. Also, politicians are having not so well-developed communication skills themselves and are unwilling to learn. So when you talk to them about technology and social media, they think, okay, first of all, kind of skeptic, but if they're open to the idea, they say, okay, but you should do it, someone else. They're not interested in learning, they're not interested in acquiring the skills that would make them engage with, with basically anyone, either uh, in, in the bubble or outside the bubble in, um, in a strategic way. So there's a lack of resources. But again, I think most interestingly, there's these political divisions within the party groups that basically strangulate any kind of attempt to collaborate and move the communication in one, um, in one consistent direction. So the reason why they do not use technology is because the technology is, is um, seen as um, secondary, if you wish, to other priorities, which is getting together and finding a common message at all, in any form, in traditional media, in personal communication, or in uh, social media-based communication. There are divisions that prevent communication to take a coherent form to begin with. And then, what I think is very interesting, there's risk aversion. Risk aversion, maybe something also something you are familiar with. There's a huge amount of, um, of carefulness Again, illustrated very well by, by the example with a virtual reality. Uh, politicians do not dare to say anything meaningful because it can be controversial. And so we don't need technology to tell us that, in a sense. Basically, this is the problem. Uh, it, there's a lot of um, trite comments, like, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so am I. But, you know, like, uh, what more, you know? What, what can we say? Like, everything is beautiful, everything is fantastic, and Europe does everything for you, and I'm doing a lot of things for you. Nobody wants to hear this, not even people who, you know, are paid to follow uh, and listen, right? So there needs to be some form of authenticity, and this is where, again, examples like um, Katerina's are so fantastic because they are not actually from the top down, they're from bottom up, and this is where technology could be used in a very clear and strategic way. For example, if politicians would pay attention to what the citizen would say, would run a content analysis of what the citizen's concerns are who follow them on Twitter or who follow them on Facebook or on LinkedIn or on Instagram or on another channel, which I'm not familiar with, they could recruit, in a sense, the citizens and, and listen to their concerns implicitly. And on the basis of a content analysis, they could formulate meaningful messages that would actually respond to the concerns citizens already expressed. And this is a, a, a very nice way in which both emotion and technology would cooperate in order to create better quality content. 
But of course, if you say something that carries a, a position, if you take a stance, somebody will disagree with you. Not everybody will love you. Somebody will also say, I disagree with this position. And politicians uh, and their communicators seem to be indeed uh, very careful to uh, avoid that that situation. And thus, we're left with the type of uh, interactions that I just showed you with a lot of at mentions to each other and no actual content. So the conclusions uh, to uh, my very brief uh, presentation here is that um, the European institutions and the EP groups uh, specifically that I looked at, but again, uh, I can speak probably for more than the EP groups because some of these communicators worked in other uh, European um, organizations before. So the European institutions were not early adopters nor innovators when it comes to the communication realm. If you contrast whatever happens in the uh, EU with what happens in the United States, there's like two different planets uh, because in the United States there's a huge emphasis on uh, technology, on uh, data-driven communication, cooperation with, with companies that deliver this type of products. This is not even on the agenda for any of the, uh, of the communicators that I uh, talk to and people that I talk to more generally. Uh, there's no technology-driven communication. I'm, I know it's a very, very radical statement, but I am you know, communicating this to you because it seems to be quite, um, quite a, an acute, um, acute lack in a world where EU is promoting a lot of technology, where they're uh, developing technology. They're not using it strategically to their own benefit. And um, again, I do not really have an explanation for this, um, so I'm curious what you think. Um, in general, there is an inconsistency uh, in the use of social media and of technology. There's some communicators, again, I think Dan here is a great illustration, who are very innovative and driven, and there are other communicators who are learning the ropes, getting getting accustomed to things they're maybe not as experienced, and it's about the commu the person of the communicator and the person of the um, of the politicians that they are, um, personality of the politicians that they're working with, that the result is really depending on. Not on a consistent strategy, not on a consistent technology use, not on developed targeted tools. So the results are very uneven. If you have the luck of a good communicator uh, that also seems to work with a good politician that wants to communicate and wants to, uh, or allows at least for for room for communication, then it's happening. But this is uh, more the exception rather than the, the rule. So my, my diagnosis uh, is that there is definitely an underutilized potential for pan-European communication via social media, even though it seems there are a lot of very good, um, um, so, so there's a very good basis for, for the potential to develop in this direction. I don't see this being uh, put to work in reality very much by the uh, party, party groups and by parties themselves. And I'm not necessarily talking about the commission and the parliament as such, because uh, they are not necessarily interested in campaigning on targeting, whereas party groups, they need to connect with citizens. That's kind of the idea of representative democracy. So I think there's lots of implications here that uh, I would love to, to hear more, more um, people discussing. What's about technology? What about social media? What about strategic communication? Because it's not just a, a question of, of experts like us in the room, communicators talking to others, but it is a question of uh, politics, it's a question of democracy, and it's a way to, to, increase, um, to increase representativity and to maybe solve this big democratic deficit that the European Union um, has had for all these many years. So it's not a, obviously a universal panacea, and absolutely that's not what I'm saying, but it's definitely a, a useful um, conversation and a useful, uh, useful tool to think about. And with this, um, I thank you for your attention.